So this, this presentation is our denominator to Bayes' theorem, okay? This is our normalizing constant. This is some of the math that's kind of going in in the background of how this thing's actually being solved. So it's for short term name, the, the lecture is called DEMC. That's differential evolution, Markovo chain, Monte Carlo. So we'll break each one of those parts. We'll break Monte Carlo out, Markovo chain, differential evolution out as we go along. So well, this, so <clears throat> basically in this lecture, I'm gonna go through each of the parts. Like I said, we're gonna define the Monte Carlo, Markovo chain, and DE. And then we're gonna kind of try to look at how that's actually being done in, in, in best fit um, in Bayes' theorem in some mm, simpler examples. So again, we're talking about the, dom the, the denominator of the Bayes' theorem here. So this is our normalizing constant, the sum of all of our likelihoods of all the samples of our probab probability distribution. You've seen it, you've averaged, you've added, you've accumulated that thing across the many columns across that one row and you get that, um, and you get that small number. So, but so why do we need something like DEMC to solve the denominator? Anybody know? We're first we're first solving a continuous model, right? Like like Jim pointed, it's we're not we're we're not doing every sample, right? We're, it's just a continuous model, and there's rarely a closed form solution to this thing. So basically, we can't solve it algebraically. Like you just can't solve it. Um, for the most part, it's mathematically impossible. So <clears throat> what that means is we need a smart way to, that's not random, um, but a smart way to search for the answer. It's not random and it's something you can actually test some fitness to how, how well your sampling is actually doing along the way so you can get better along the way. So um, in best fit, the search operation is done by differential evolution, Markovo chain, Monte Carlo, also like I said, known as DEMC. So, we, you've seen this trace plots in the spreadsheets if you looked at them. So in best fit, there's an option you can look at the Markovo chains. So this is a Markovo chain from a best fit analysis. So notice there's this, there's six of them here. So all six, this is for mean. So all six chains are laid over the top of each other. But remember, each chain or trace is basically starting from let's do it, this end, starting from this point over here. This is like the first sample second sample, third sample, and so on. They're just all connected with a, from left to right as, it get, as it's sampling the probability distribution for mean. It's just putting that on this graph from left to right so you can just see how it's sampled it over time. So that's what this chain is. Okay, we'll, we'll call, talk about that more. Anyway, so Monte Carlo sampling is a method of analysis developed in the early 1940s and uses a statistical sampling technique in obtaining a probabilis probabilistic um, approximation to the solution for a mathematical equation or model. So basically, it uses randomness to solve problems that might be deterministically in principle. So, and one of those problems, turns out, is a way of generating samples from probability distributions, like an LP3. So just for note now, um, that by the time hopefully we finish this lecture, you'll understand that what's actually happening in Bayes is not just completely random. It's, it's actually got a lot of intuitive uh, adaptive functionality, but you have Monte Carlo in there that does do that random sampling as part of it. So now just for information, the Monte Carlo came from the inventors um, whose uncle was a gambling addict and his favorite casino was the Monte, Monte Carlo of Mon uh, Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo of Morocco, if I could say that right. And so they needed a code name. This is that back in the uh, Manhattan project when this was developed for and endearing. So they needed a code name, Monte Carlo, the, the casino. And that's where it came from. That's where the name is. <laughs> so the general purpose of Monte Carlo is to estimate uncertainty in model outputs when model inputs are uncertain. So an example of a flow frequency, example of this is of course the flow frequency curve because um, there's definitely uncertainty in the probability distribution of, of, the, of that given the data. So. The idea with Monte Carlo is that we can get an unbiased representative group of samples from a large range of possibilities if we allow the simulation to evolve randomly. And, and we do that, we need to sample like hundreds of thousands of times to, to, act, to actually build a good output. So the basic steps, 
is you, you got to build the model and you assign it a probability a distribution and you're sampling that the model inputs based on your probability distribution and then you record your outputs and repeat over and over and over and over and over. So uh, we'll go through a couple of very cheesy, easy examples, hopefully. So a sample, you know, is rolling. So an example is rolling two dice. So there's 36 combinations um, that we can calculate the probability distribution of the dice, right? So we can calculate that pretty easily. So if we take a random sample of dice roll um, using Monte Carlo sampling, based on the math, there's six ways to roll a seven. So six out of th 36 is 16.7 percent. So for a sample, for a simple case of Monte Carlo using two dice, the probability of getting a seven is 16.7. So you can calculate that pretty easy deterministically. So now let's use, let's look at this just roughly using Monte Carlo. Let's take a, here's like a thousand results or a hundred. This is a hundred samples. So after a hundred samples, it's not exactly the, the distribution isn't exactly what you would expect, right? We've only done hundred. We know what it is deterministically. We can calculate it, but after a hundred samples, it's still kind of funky. Seven is, eh, seven is actually less than six. So that's not actually possible, right? So anyway, I'll look at um, 10,000 results. So this is just using at risk, just running, you know, probably just doing the, doing the Monte Carlo in at risk. So anyway, after 10,000, we're starting to at least get a shape of the distribution that you would expect. <laughs> um, it's still not quite right. So, but after 100,000 example sampling, so if you sample Monte Carlo enough randomly, you're gonna get the determination, the, the, the probability distribution that you expect. But again, Monte Carlo, you can get to an answer pretty quick on things that you can't quickly deterministically solve. So that is just an example of what's kind of happening with Monte Carlo. So let's look at another example. So let's take um, a coin flip and some dice. So coin flip says, you know, heads, rain, tails, no rain. And then if we flip rain, we roll some dice to get the depth of the rain. So again, you got 36 combinations of depth, but you get the, depth, the possible depth of range. So in this case, the rain and the magnitude are your random variables. And the distribution of this thing, the distribution is your coin and your dice. So this becomes a Monte Carlo simulation when the coin is flipped and the die is rolled hundreds of thousands of times, and then you uh, record the output. So this is after 100,000 samplings of the Monte Carlo. So as you would hopefully expect, 50% of the time is a heads, no tails, it heads, tails. So 50% of the time, it should be no rain. But 50% of the time, you do get rain. So you get this distribution of the possible depths uh, with the remaining 50%. So it's Remember originally seven was 16.7%. Now it's down here at like half of that because you have half the probability coming into it. But this is. Two dice, two dice, two dice. Yeah, you can't get odd number rainfall with one dice. Well, you can't get seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 inches. I know, I corrected it in my form. I saw that when I was going over it. I'm like, I saw it, it says A dice, and I'm like, I couldn't correct it on this one in time. I corrected it on mine, on my desktop over there. I said, I read A six dice, and Ryan's gonna call me out on it, I know it. I thought the same thing, I read six die, and I was like, wait, how do I get more than six inches? Oh, yeah, that's right, I was using, and I pulled up my at risk, and yeah, I'm using two die. That's what it was meant to do, so, okay. Markovo chain. So this is a stochastic model describing a sequence of possible events in which the probability of each event is dependent only on the state attained by the previous event. I'm going to say that in a lot of different ways. So it's a systematic method of sampling variables that are dependent on the last variable in the chain or the last variable sam sampled. So again, imagine if you have the, you know, the, 3,000 here sampled. Basically, each sample, each, each one is sampled, is dependent on the previous sample. So that's why you see it make up a chain. So 
think of Markable Chain uh, more like a, oh, well, okay, so think of Markable Chain maybe more like a board game, like um, Shoots and Ladders. Does everybody kind of know what Shoots and Ladders are? When it is, right? So uh, Shoots and Ladders is made up of, you roll a dice, you move to position. So <clears throat> the position on your board is the previous sample. The roll of your dice is your probability distribution. Whatever number you get from the roll of dice moves you to the next position. So your sample is completely dependent. So the position on your shoots and ladder board, if you're on number 10, you roll a three, you move to 13, right? So uh, <clears throat> I think I start talking about it here. So um, it, basically what we're trying to say is that the mark of a chain is the sample is dependent on the previous one. So just like a shoots and ladder, you're in some position on the board, you get a roll, you move to the next position. You can only get to the next, next position because of the previous position. So it's dependent on its previous state, its previous sample. So with Markable Chain, the, the process for predicting future outcomes. Oh, yeah, that's a different. Um, so uh, in Best Fit, we, uh, we have three parameters, the LP3. Um, Monte Carlo, uh, so log person has three parameters, and so we run two chains per parameter. And we'll get to the reason we can do six chains at once is because of differential evolution. So at some point, I'll hopefully explain that in here. But you, you can actually take um, as many chains you want per parameter because of the way differential evolution works. So you don't. And it's a lot more fast. So the more change you use, the faster you can solve to the, the answer is, is what it comes down to. You don't need a whole bunch more. It turns out you can probably, you can solve this just as fast probably with three or four chains or three chains versus six chains. Anyway, the point is the, it's the algorithm itself that allows you to have more chains. But so this is six chains per parameter. If that makes any sense. <laughs> But that's what it is. It's it's actually six different chains running. Sorry, I'll explain more of that in a minute. Okay. So, um, future outcomes are based solely on the present state. Or let's see, predicting future outcomes are based solely on the present state. And what's important about that is predict the predictions are just as good as the ones that could have come if you knew the full process. So what I'm trying to say is the the next sample is completely, um, it's solely based on that present state. Like you, it doesn't, it's not affected by um, the full history. So, okay, the proposals are independent from the future and past states. Okay, let's see if we can explain this a little better. So the next proposal is independent from the past and future, but it is dependent on the previous location of the chain. So again, talking about those games, I'm going to just pull up shoots and ladders. So if, so one of these, like this one's sitting here on 10, it moves to 14. So the, the 14 and 10 are like your samples. Like 14 would be completely dependent on 10. Like you can't get to 14 unless you're already at 10. So it's completely dependent on that state variable. But the roll of the dice is completely independent from all past and future, right? So it's this mixture of each position on the board. So each position on the board through, as you're going through the shoots and ladder is your sample and your roll of the dice is that probability distribution that you're picking each time. And so that process through the board is your mark of a chain. That's, so it's, it's kind of a, it's basically that's what it is. It's just, you're just moving through, the, it's a random walk through the, through the shoots and ladders. It's random, it's not quite random, but it's randomly sampling. Um, so you just have these positions, which are state variables, and, and then the probability distribution is completely independent. So you can get any roll of the dice anytime and move forward. So, okay. So there's another thing called random walk. Um, it's the same kind of concept. Mathematically, this thing is just moving randomly around but it's completely de dependent on where it was, but it's randomly moving about, but it's dependent on where it was. Anyway, it's just, uh, I'm gonna try to play. <laughs> I'm hopefully you can explain this a little better with. Uh... 
You can randomly walk, yeah. Yeah. Let's try this with blackjack. So you, blackjack and shoots and ladder sound completely different. In Markable Chain world, it's not quite. So with blackjack, a player can remember, you can remember or count cards to give yourself some advantage to predicting what, you know, be able to predict what that next card might be when it comes up next, um, you know, based on the knowledge that you have of what's been played and what's been seen. So the sequence of cards played and the choice to see another card start to form a chain. That the cards that come out, that's each one is dependent, right? But we still have the random proposed next card. You don't know what that next card is going to be. It's going to be random. But because we know the cards have been, because we know what cards have been played and what cards are left, we have some knowledge about the chain and can be more informed about what that next choice is. So this kind of chain, this kind of adaptive knowledge as you proceed through the sampling kind of grows from the application of just Markov chain to the differential evolution Markov chain, where you have adapted knowledge to help inform each sampling of the chain as it moves along. I don't know if that helps. Those are simple games, trying to simple concepts to explain the, these harder level statistics. Again, these are like college degree master level kind of statistics. So we're just trying to give you a basis for a small basis of trying to understand it. So, so we'll, we'll just jump into differential evolution. So, so let's talk about this one. So differential evolution, also known, of course, as DE. DE is a method of opt that optimizes a problem by iteratively trying to improve a candidate solution regarding a given measure or quality. So meaning that DE allows for a way to look at a proposed theta or proposed model that we're talking about and evaluate and determine whether to accept that sample, that LP3 parameter set, or reject it. So let's look at a couple of animations and see if they'll help any. So this is a 3D animation. Come on. Um, so this is showing that DE starts by searching the space, kind of, I don't know if you can see it, like the, the little blacks, they come back and forth, but the little black dots start on the outside and they end up, after a, a number of iterations, end up solving towards the, the minimum on this chart. Now, the last time we're looking for a maximum, but same thing. Um, so each sample is moving closer to the target, our target space that we're looking for, um, using uh, mathematical formulas to determine like a new position, um, or a position in the parameter space that helps that gets you a, a, an approved answer. So uh, some of these. So if it's accepted, um, it's moved closer. If it might be discarded and, and just otherwise it just discards it. So in this animation, the little black dots, of course, are showing the process of moving the target into the target location. So that's what we're trying to find in best fit for the first few evolutions. We're trying to find ourselves. Um, if you remember with the maybe some of the traces, there's some really high outliers, and then they sort down into a, a pretty pretty tight space. Well, that's our target area that we're trying to get to. So that's what this is kind of indicating. It's moving to that target lo location, given adaptive um, algorithms to help it figure out how to move that direction. And it's using a lot of different examples to get there. So, so but important to note that this type of op optimization is a global optima. So rather than a local, so basically, a local optima finds the, the min-max of the ob objective function for a given region of an input space. So whereas the global um, is finding the optima for the, the whole space. So if that makes sense, we'll look at a 2D here. So this is a Ned, uh, Nedler med um, search option here. So it's a 2D, it's a local search. So if you've used HMS, HMS by default, its optimization is simplex. Simplex is basically a, Ned, a, a Nedler med. And then there's a new option for DE, which is what I would suggest. But anyway, the point is um, the simplex or, or a Nedler med is a local optimization. So what can happen is like you have on this graph, you have one, two, three, four possible maximum um, likelihood locations. With a local optima, you can find one of those and get kind of trapped in that region and never search the rest of the region space. 
So you might capture your most likely with that. You might capture your optimized values in that region, but you very well can miss it. So local optimas like, um, like Nedler Med here in the 2D can miss an optimization. Whereas a DE, differential evolution, will search this entire space and it will find which one is the maximum or which one is the minimum, whatever you're looking for. So it's a, like in this space, it's a little bit hard to tell. This is searching the whole area and it's solving down to this. This is just helping you know, like, like this point right here might be a minimum there. It's just solving to that whole region down to that one spot right there. So, but a local solver, a local optimization can only solve in one little region. Big difference in optimization that you can get. So um, for just reference, if, if you're doing optimization in HMS, I still recommend that you switch to differential evolution. It's gonna take longer, but it's gonna give you a better answer. It's gonna be a better optimization than the default simplex. So another little concept in best fit is thinning. I'm gonna just go through this real quick. So these are defaults and, and you don't have to change this. So best fit is set up so that you're gonna get a good answer right out of the box. It's gonna do six chains um, per parameter. You probably only need two or three, but by default, six ensures that it does it correctly. Thinning is 20, is set to 20. So what that basically means is, it's a weird term for it, right? Every, so if you run um, 20 evolutions in best fit, it's gonna pull, um, well, if you run 10,000, if you run hundreds of thousands, it doesn't really matter it's gonna pull every 20th evolution and that's what you're gonna see as output. And it's gonna, you're not gonna see the other output. So basically what that means in the, it does the, this is the warm-up period, the 1500 and 3000. Um, it's gonna do that times 20. That's how many actual evolutions, how many times it's actually sampling in the background. And then you get another 10,000 as the posterior distribution. You've heard us say like, you see the 10,000 chains in best fit or the 10,000 we talked about. Those are actually, every 20th pulled out. So it's technically 10,000 times 20 in the background round. It turns out, and you don't really recognize this, but best fit's actually running nearly 600,000 evolutions every time you run um, a, a simulation. But you're really only seeing those 10,000 because that's all you really need to do the credible intervals and predictive pairs. But this is just some of the basics that these, some of the higher level things that are in best fit. You got these default options that are basically set up so that you will ensure that you get a good post distribution. So just for reference, this is autocorrelation. So if you remember the, um, the chains, right? Like when we say every state is um, dependent on the previous state, that means they're gonna have really high correlation, right? Like if one state goes to the next state, it's gonna be highly coordinated, correlated. So it turns out you can't really do credible intervals when you have highly correlated data. It doesn't work. You need sampling error for uncertainty. And if everything's highly correlated, you have no sampling error. Anyway, so the point is, if you take every one sample, it's gonna be highly correlated. Every two, um, pretty highly correlated. But out here at 20, if you take every 20th evolution, that means from one sample to the other, you're getting highly uncorrelated, correlated, so you can get really good credible intervals. So that's some of the depths within best fits, what's happening. Do you have a question? Yeah, they're, like, the mean is dependent on the standard deviation of skew. Yeah, they're all working as a group, solving towards the most likely. But you see the individual chains for each individual parameter, but they are solving together. This is kind of have like 18 chains kind of working towards the most likely but they won't ever, they won't ever just converge because there's small differences. I mean, yeah, you can get a small difference in basically the same answer. So just, you don't ever really get a convergence. Okay, so <clears throat> trying to put this DEMC together. So, so putting this together allows for the samples to be drawn. Um, so using DEMC, that allows us to draw the samples from the probability distribution and then construct chains from that. So that this sampling process, this adaptive um, uh, sampling process, it gives us the ability to, to find the answer and the, the denominator and rather than solve it algebraically. Um, so again, we construct those chains, 
and then um, mathematically determine that, you know, if a sample, so the process mathematically determines if the sample is accepted or uh, discarded. And so, yeah, I'm just showing some of the best of options. So sampling, so again, the main, when I say target space, it's, it, maybe it's, I don't know if it's as easier, like, so this is where we're starting now. It quickly solves to the target space, and that's why you see it like this. So anytime you're doing a, a Markovoe chain and MCMC, you want to see this blending, this, this dense area between your, your chains. That means you're searching in the proper region. If it's sporadic, then it's, something's gone wrong. Um, so this is an example of a type of DEMC. So this is called um, Random Walk Metropolis Hastings. Um, it's a differential evolution is actually a more adaptive, more efficient uh, version of Random Walk uh, Metropolis Hastings. But this is a YouTube video and it has a really good explanation of what's actually happening. So we have the link on here if you ever want to watch it. And we just have a short skit of it, but it's actually goes through and explains really, uh, they have a really good way of explaining it with more information. But <clears throat> essentially, let's I'll hit play. So you have, this is the bivariate plot that's just showing where it's being sampled in space, in the parameter space. You have a posterior distribution over here of parameters from say a mean standard deviation skew, right? This is the, this is the, this is the probability density of, of that. Yeah, this is your probability and distribution of a singular parameter. And then these chains from left to right match up, basically make this histogram. So at best of it, you can look at a histogram after your run, and it's basically showing you um, the histogram of the samples taken. And this is just like the actual space of the, the, the parameter itself, like where the target space is versus where it may have sampled. So. Like hidden. So it's, it's accepting values and discarding values, but I don't know if that makes sense. So like, as you sample 10,000, however many we're sampling, you build a, a, a density function or a histogram of that parameter. Well, in this case, it's hard to tell, but what's actually, what's happening is that it, it can tell um, because it's an adaptive, let me go to the next screen and see if I can answer that. So I have, Ryan knows this one. I have, we have this silly sort of game like thing to kind of represent what's happening with DEMC. So <clears throat> the idea here is, let's see if I can read this. So basically what happens when you have multiple chains, that means you have multiple guessers. We're going to talk about this. We have multiple guessers called chains that can learn from previous guesses. Not only their own chain, learning from where it's been, it, they actually learn from each other. They learn from the other chains. So you have multiple guessers that are all talking to each other and telling each other which direction to go towards the target space. Within the algorithm itself, given that, they know whether a, a set of parameters sampled um, is heading in the right direction or not, for lack of better terms. And if it's, there's a mathematical calculation, if it gets a certain, if it hits a certain threshold, it tosses it because it means it's not heading in the right direction. So, so, yeah, this is, so this is, again, this is a highly efficient, adaptive process. Um, so thinking about this thing, each chain or guesser will initially make a random guess that's independent of each other. So this is where the random part is, but they're still dependent on the chain. So we, the little X's is our three chains. We make a guess. So with each guess, they check the fitness of their guess. So in other words, in here, we're looking to see, we're looking for an image. There's an image hidden. If there's not an image, you get an X. So it hasn't found anything yet. So they keep searching until they find something. Yeah, see, it found something. So each chain or guess in, you know, is informing the other. So once one kind of finds something, and they all start kind of walking and looking in the same direction or same area, same target space of that parameter. So once somebody, and so we start walking those, each of those chains, they quickly 
diverge into the same target space as they and they keep working until they find um, that actual target space, and then that's what they're they're solving through. So I don't. This is a silly concept to try to explain something very complex, but basically, like those X's, you just have chains that are they're each independent, but they talk to each other. So they can walk themselves into the target space very quickly. That's what I said. We use six chains per parameter. You could probably get by with like half that and still find your target space. But we want to find those LP3 parameters that are giving us our most likely um, values. And once we find that target space, we want to sample an additional number of samples. So we get out those 10,000. So we're basically pulling out those 10,000. Yeah, it could have been. Ideal, ideally, yeah. Yeah, he went too far. He went past it. There was nothing there. So toss it out. It was like a, and so head back up <laughs> kind of idea. That's a simple way of thinking about it. This, this is a really simple way of thinking about a complex. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they still have to work their way to the target, but they're working their way quickly in the right direction. They can make some big jumps, given that they're they're especially in best bet where you have six chains trying to get there. Um, if you look at the the results for the for your, if you look at a best fit and you look at the, the mark of a chains, you can turn on the warm up period. You'll see like it converges into that target area within like a hundred or so evolutions. It, it happens really fast because it, it's, again, it's a highly adaptive, highly efficient search engine that can find a parameter that gets you into the most likely area. And then once you're there, and once we know we're there, we're gonna execute um, roughly 200,000 more evolutions so we can pull out those 10,000 posterior distributions in that, that's in that target space. So we guarantee we're in the right target space when we do that posterior distribution of the 10,000. Once we're there, we have our most likely, we can calculate our predictive curves and our credible intervals. I don't know if that helps, but. That's our target space. No, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to uncover everything. It, yeah, I don't know if I can answer that directly. I it it knows enough from uh, like it knows enough from this space. That I could figure out pretty quickly that you're you're starting to get your most likely log likely value, or you're in that space of log likely. Like you're going to get a closer to zero pretty quick if you start. You don't need to search all the space out here to figure out that you're just getting bigger log likely values. I think it. I, yeah, like. Yeah, like the DE was a, I, I don't know how to exactly explain it. Like I said, it's complex in itself, but it can't, it will search. It will guarantee that you're finding the global space that it finds the, the maximum. Can't exactly define it. Like I said, this, we're looking at dumbed down concepts of what's actually happening, but it, it is a complete global solver. I can tell you with like HMS, every time I've, every time I've done, um, the differential evolution for optimization over simplex. I've gotten a different. I've gotten a better, uh, more optimized answer every time. Um, it, it, it's yeah, it's a max for man. Same concept. Um, we're doing maximums, but the, it, it'll work for minimums as well. But we're we're looking for maximums. So a max, so it, 
the maximum log likelihood is the closer negative to zero. It's, it's that, yeah, it's that uniform distribution we start out with. So like this, the, the mean we start out with zero to seven and it's gonna search that and it's gonna quickly figure out that it's like four point something. But if you wanted to better define that with like skew, you tell, you, you tell it a skew and it's gonna to try to search within that space. It's gonna tighten it up and have some a little bit more weight, but yeah. It's pretty, yeah, it's random. First position's random. And so the first few are probably random, but they, they start to learn really quick. I guess I, I, I probably could pull it up on Best Fit and show you, like, let me see something. Okay, we're at the end. <laughs> 